Now this morning we have a big topic ahead of us. Um, this very easily is going to be the most significant, most important message in the entire Galatians series. Um, uh, because this is the message where we're going to talk about a huge topic of God's law versus God's promise. Now I realize that uh, there is quite a bit of confusion out there regarding God's law, God's promise. In fact, even just saying that, it would be actually pretty common. There's probably a majority of people listening that might not even have any idea what I'm talking about. Uh, no idea what the difference between those two are or what those two things even are. Uh, and so the confusion between God's law and the promise that Paul's going to explore in Galatians 3 and 4, it, it really is the root cause of so much of the confusion and questions that we get about the Bible, like the whole Bible. So for example, someone might come and ask, why is there an Old Testament and a New Testament? Like, why is, it, like, why is there two distinct parts of the Bible? And the root cause, the root confusion in that question is confusion regarding the law and the promise. Or someone might come and ask, you know, I've been reading some of the Old Testament. Am I supposed to be, like, doing those laws that Moses talks about? Like Deuteronomy? And the root cause of that question is confusion regarding God's law versus God's promise. In fact, sometimes you might even hear comments. Maybe it's not even a question. Maybe it's just a comment along the lines of, wow, you know, it seems like the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are, are, are maybe different. They kind of like feel a little different as I'm reading passages from the Old Testament versus passages in the New Testament. Again, the root cause of that kind of comment or confusion is this confusion regarding God's law versus God's promise. There's quite a bit of confusion regarding these, these two Ideas, God's law and God's promise, and, and that is a, actually the exact confusion. Maybe if, you, if that's where you're at, that's actually the confusion that was the root cause of the Galatian churches and what they were wrestling with in this letter. See, false teachers had infiltrated these Galatian churches and told them that good Christians, right, Christians who were going to like receive God's blessing, they essentially needed to be following the Old Testament laws. There's confusion between God's laws and God's promises. Now perhaps this morning you've never even heard about God's law versus God's promise and, and boy, you are in the right place right now. Uh, this morning, a whole lot of the Bible is all of a sudden gonna make way more sense for you. If you've never heard God's law, God's promise before, get ready. Like. The whole Bible is going to make sense now. Well, big parts of the Bible make sense. There might be some questions afterwards. Now, we're going to be reading from Galatians chapter 3 and 4 this morning. And I have to warn you that this section of Galatians is a bit tricky. It's complicated. In fact, I was reading one commentator on this section, a famous commentator said, this is one of the most difficult passages Paul ever wrote. Galatians 3 and 4. And the reason why this passage is so difficult and tricky uh, is, is because we need a key concept in order to unlock this passage. Like if we, if we, if we don't have this key concept, Galatians 3 and 4 will never fully make sense. We'll read them and we'll still be scratching our heads afterwards. Now Paul tries to actually tell us and inform us. He, he tells us directly what this key concept is that we need over and over and over. In fact, if you go back later after this message, you'll realize that the, this key concept was never actually hidden. Uh, perhaps we just didn't really understand the full significance of what Paul was saying when he told us what the key concept is. So let's just start this morning by giving you the key concept. 
the key idea, idea that unlocks everything in these two semi-complex chapters. The key to understanding almost everything. So last week, we focused on the beginning portion, beginning uh, 14 verses of Galatians chapter 3, and we heard about God's promise that he had given to Abraham, right? And that promise was that all nations on earth would be blessed through you, Abraham. And when we heard Paul talking about God's promise, he also referred and, 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 and mentioned the blessing, right? Kind of used those two terms interchangeably as he was talking. And, and Paul is really referencing the same thing when he's talking about, ultimately the same thing when he's talking about God's promise and God's blessing, which is the Holy Spirit. So if you remember, here is the final verse we looked at last week. Verse 14. This is where Paul tells us the key that we need to understand the book of Galatians. He said, he, as in Jesus, right, redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So the key concept, the key thing you'll need to understand everything in these, in these complex chapters is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the main idea that unlocks everything in chapters three and four. And recognizing that like, the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of this promise, right? This is exactly what Paul just told us in, in verse 14. We need to keep that in mind as we read the rest of, the, of these chapters. So the big idea, the key concept that we need to unlock this whole idea of God's law versus God's promise to start understanding that is the Holy Spirit. In fact, the key to understanding the whole book of Galatians is the Holy Spirit. It's, what, it, it's the culmination of the whole book. It's the Holy Spirit. If you want to understand the purpose and function of the Holy Spirit, if you, if you better dig in and, and, and start to really understand what the Holy Spirit does in our life, well then, the Old Testament laws, they begin to make way more sense. Or if you begin to dig in and understand the, the function and purpose of the Holy Spirit in our life, the, the distinctions between the Old Testament and the New Testament begin to make way more sense. Or, or even the grand story arc of the Bible begins to make way more sense. So understanding the purpose and function of the Holy Spirit is a big deal. It's a huge deal. These two chapters, that, that's sort of what Paul's talking about. If we want to understand what Paul is telling us, we need to keep in mind this big key concept, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to start small this morning, real small. We're not going to go into every, all the, 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 the functions and purpose, like everything the Holy Spirit does in our life. We're, we're just going to take one little nibble, one bite, right? One of the, the many functions of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we'll already, even just taking one little nibble, just talking a little bit about the Holy Spirit, we'll begin to understand the law versus the promise and, and quite a bit of the stuff in, in this passage will begin to make total sense what Paul's trying to communicate. So let's just explore one of the many functions of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we hear about one of those functions. Uh, uh, Jesus tells us about what the Holy Spirit's going to be doing in our life in the Gospel of John. So Jesus says the following in regards to the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. It's our advantage. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away... The Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so one of the, the key functions of the Holy Spirit is conviction. Conviction. And conviction's a, a word that, that simply means the Holy Spirit tells us 
when something is wrong, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us if we're, if we're guilty of something. Uh, and, and, and the Holy Spirit's convicting us with the purpose of redemption and restoration, the purpose of seeking reconciliation. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit basically helps us to know if something is toxic in our life. In fact, the Holy Spirit is, is working to warn us, to like warning, 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 red flags, right? That something is poison for our souls. So there you go. One of the functions, purposes of the Holy Spirit, is conviction. Pretty straightforward. Jesus died so that the Holy Spirit could come and be present and working in our lives, in part to bring about conviction. Paul said in Galatians 3.14, we just read it, he, Jesus, redeemed us in order that the blessing giving to, given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now one of the big differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament, this big this big portion in the Bible where it's like there's two halves there, the, the big difference between those two halves is how the Holy Spirit functions and works in our lives. In the Old Testament, before Jesus, like the first half, right, uh, people might suddenly be empowered by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, or perhaps, you know, and, and, and what does it mean to be empowered? What's that look like? There's many examples. They might perhaps be empowered to deliver a message from God, right? A prophecy. Or like Samson in Judges 14, he was empowered and given like superhuman strength, ripped apart a lion, pretty wild passage, Judges 14. Or Bezalel, right? In, in Exodus 31, he was empowered, but in a different way. He was empowered with, with wisdom and understanding and all kinds of skills, crafts, right? To be capable of crafting the Ark of the Covenant, right? And so, uh, but we recognize that this empowering the Holy Spirit does in the Old Testament, if you go back and look at those references, they're often temporary and circumstantial. Temporary and circumstantial. In the Old Testament, there were people, right, who, who occasionally were empowered by the Holy Spirit. This, this happened, and we hear about it in many different stories. And the problem is the full might of God, like the full presence and glory of God, remains locked away in the temple behind a thick veil the holy of holies. And every so often, every like just barely once in a while, right, someone in the Old Testament like bumps into, would, would encounter and experience uh, the full presence of God, right? And when that happened, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. Most of the people who stumble into the full presence of God die. Old Testament. And that's because they're entering into the presence of, of a perfect and holy and just God, a good God, and, and they're entering into his presence with sin and guilt and brokenness. And when they do that, man, a good judge has, has like, renders a verdict. The intensity of God's perfection like, and his justice incinerates them. Only once a year, in fact, does, does someone, most of the time, safely enter into the presence of God. And it's the high priest would go into the, the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the only one guy, right? And it was only after this elaborate process of confessing and repenting of every single sin in their life. And, and it, was, it was sketchy at best when this happened, right? Because even the high priest might enter into the presence of God and die. And that's why it was critical. 
what Paul said, that Jesus redeemed us. He needed to redeem us, make us sinless, so that not, we could experience not just the empowering of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit with kind of like a filter on it, but so that the full presence and might of God's Spirit that was locked behind the veil would be unleashed into our lives. That we might experience coming into the full presence of God. Now, because the people in the Old Testament only had that circumstantial empowering, right, but not the full presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, guess what people in the Old Testament were missing? They were missing something. They were missing some of those functions of the Holy Spirit. They were missing the conviction of the Holy Spirit, for example. And that means they, they wouldn't know if they were guilty of something. They wouldn't know if something was toxic in their life. They, they, they like wouldn't have that warning siren going off if they were about to drink poison for their souls. And as you read through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, it becomes glaringly obvious, right, that the people of the Old Testament were missing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a big problem. So for example, early on, Exodus chapter 32, the Israelites come to uh, Aaron, the high priest, as they're at the base of Mount Sinai, and they tell Aaron that they want to worship God. Like, let's worship God. And so Aaron builds them a golden calf, an idol. And he says, behold, here is the God who brought you out of Egypt, right? And then Aaron, the high priest, he throws a giant drunken party and engages in, key word that's in there, revelry. And that basically means it was a giant drunken sex party, right? The translators try to clean it up so that when we read that passage out loud, we don't blush. Exodus 32, 6. And just imagine what it is like without the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? It, it looks like the high priest is building a giant golden calf idol and then organizing a giant drunken sex party to worship God. So what do we learn from this story? Well, without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing to prevent us from like slipping into cor corruption. There, there is nothing to stop us from accidentally like drinking poison for our souls. There is nothing to stop us from destroying ourselves. Ah, except, but wait, the law. You know, the law sounds like this. It sounds like someone coming to Aaron the high priest. Hey, Aaron, I love you, but you're a high-speed train wreck, buddy. Like, you are off the rails. You have no idea what you're doing, and you're the high priest. Boy, Aaron, I'm going to give you some grace. I'm going to try to help you. Aaron, here is the book of Leviticus. And FYI, right? Idols and like drunken sex parties is not how we worship God. <laughs> like that's poison, Aaron. So as you read scripture, as you start reading through the first five books of the Bible, over and over and over, the context of God's law, right? It happens in the middle of stories even. It like goes from narrative story and then like interruption, God's law, and then more story, interruption, God's law. And so it's, it's broken up and it's incorporated into the story of Israel. And that's because, man, what ends up happening is in the context of the story, the people do something really dumb. Or, or really sinful. They don't know what they're doing. And because they don't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the law stands in and is a temporary guide. The law is there to help prevent us from poisoning ourselves <laughs> before we get into the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now the whole example I've just given you 
just looking at one of the many functions of the Holy Spirit, just, just conviction alone, right? Maybe I'm feeling convicted right now. I put this part in afterwards because uh, I have to confess, I copied all of that idea from someone else. That whole illustration, that, that concept, like, man, Aaron, like, what's going on? That actually comes from someone else. That comes from the Apostle Paul in the passage we're about to read. Galatians chapter 3. That's, that's, that, like, this idea I just communicated, that's where it comes from. So let me read for you part of today's passage, okay? But I'm going to purposefully read it for you from a translation that we don't normally, often, frequently read from, uh, just so that as we're hearing this passage, we'll sort of hear it with fresh ears. And I want you to be thinking about the key, the Holy Spirit working in our life. Listen with fresh ears as I read Galatians 3, verse 19 through 24. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there conflict, then, between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the, scripture de the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. See, how do you stop people from poisoning themselves? Like poisoning their own souls when they're missing the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives? when they're missing the conviction of the Holy Spirit? The answer, the law. See, the big idea, the key concept to understanding God's law versus God's promise is the Holy Spirit. The better we understand the Holy Spirit, the better those two things make sense. The key to understanding the book of Galatians and where Paul's going is the Holy Spirit. And, and in fact, we only covered even so far, just one of the many functions that the Holy Spirit has so far. And even just talking about conviction alone, uh, it, it already starts to unpack and make sense of what's going on in Scripture. And the more you know about the Holy Spirit, about this promise of God, the more this section of Galatians will make sense. The more the whole Bible will make sense. Okay, you have enough information now to be dangerous, to go out and start reading Galatians chapter 3 and 4. But I've also made for you, available for you, an outline that, that, that outlines some of the distinctions that Paul starts making as he goes through this chapter between the law and the Holy Spirit. And that outline kind of looks like this. Um, I have copies of this, many copies of this, out on the tables where you can pick up bulletins by the entrances. So if you want to pick one of these up and use it kind of as a helpful guide to be thinking about as you're reading through Galatians this week, uh, this basically explains and kind of highlights some of the distinctions that Paul's going to make as he progresses through chapter 3 and 4 between God's law and God's promise, how they're different how they function, the purpose behind them. Now, originally, when I outlined this message, 
I was going to spend the rest of our time together explaining this chart. Like going through it and explaining like what is uniformity versus unity. And I probably would have made this chart differently if I knew that that's not what we're going to do. If you have questions about this, they're out on the, the tables. Ask me questions, right? If, you've, if there's any confusion about this, please come ask. Um, I'll, I'll give you the bonus material, the bonus explanations. that used to be in this sermon. Now the reason I am opting out of explaining this chart to you is because we've been talking a lot about the importance of the Holy Spirit. And I thought it would be wrong of me to spend more time explaining like uh, uh, information about the Holy Spirit, distinctions about the law and the promise, without ever actually telling you how to actually experience in your life God's amazing promise. Like how to actually experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. We're gonna learn all this information about it and how important it is through this message and it's like this key thing. But then how, uh, how do we actually even experience the Holy Spirit? Like we're, we're at that point where we're not really craving more information about the Holy Spirit. Instead, tell me how all this happens in my life. And so that's what we're gonna spend our remaining time talking about. How to experience God's promise. Now to be honest, we're gonna go into much greater depth, right, about what, what this all means to experience God's promise, to experience the Holy Spirit, a part of our lives in next week's message. And that's because th this is like the culmination point of the letter of Galatians, right? This is like what it's like to receive the Holy Spirit. That is the grand finale of the book of Galatians. And so right now, I won't be able to do like grand finale-esque justice to this. But I think it's important to start planting that seed. To start thinking about, man, right now this week, in anticipation of an even greater explanation, the firework show, right? Like, what does it look like to start seeing the Holy Spirit working in a part of my life? If this is the thing, right? So I've roughly separated how to experience God's promise into three stages for you. And they're, they're kind of rough, right? It's not perfect, but, but uh, let me start going through and give you a rough explanation. It'll help us be ready for even next week. So stage one, how does this happen? How do we experience the promise in our life? It begins... The starting point is when the gospel, the good news, the gospel begins to really take root in our lives. You know, Jesus died to restore me to a personal connection and relationship with God. And the consequences of my sin and guilt, they were nailed to the cross with Jesus. And Jesus dies, the guilt that, that, that separates, those mistakes that separated me from God are removed. Like the veil in the temple has been torn. Top to bottom, right? The, that, that thing that was separating us from God's presence has been torn. God's unfiltered presence is unleashed into our lives. Now there are a lot of reasons why stage one, the gospel really begins to take root in our lives, why that might not happen. Things that might stumble that process. And we need to be aware of these concerns. In fact, uh, Jesus talks about this a lot. <laughs> Well, he gives us Matthew 13. He gives us parables about it. Uh, so, for example, he talks about this exact issue in the parable of the sower and the seeds, right? And Jesus explains to us how, how sometimes we can, like, hear on a Sunday morning, like right now we can hear the good news, the promise, but then we never sink our teeth in. We never follow up. We never ask any questions. We never grow roots. 
the message only stays at a surface level in our lives, we never let it sink in fully. The gospel never takes root in our lives. And so this, this stage one, like we're stuck there and we, and we never move on to like stage two and three. In fact, in that parable, Jesus gives a warning that if we never take roots, when the storms of life come along, they end up just washing us away. Why? Because we don't have like the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We never make it to stage two. So perhaps, uh, you know, the, the other scenario uh, that sometimes we struggle with, Jesus describes is this moment where we, where we hear all this wonderful good news, another scenario, and, and then we get really, really busy, like really busy, and we get distracted and sidetracked. Our life gets flooded with everyday emergencies. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. And so there's a, there's a lot of reasons, in fact, why it is that we might be struggling in this first stage, why it not be, might not be fully happening in our life, but as the gospel begins to take root in our lives, when it sinks to the very core, Christ died for me, for me. When we experience the veil being torn. It changes us. You know, A.W. Tozer has a famous saying that describes this moment. He talks about how the veil in the temple was torn, but there is this moment when the gospel sinks in and the veil in our heart is torn also. And that leads us to stage two. Stage two. Stage one, the gospel really starts to sink in and take root in our life. Stage two, the Holy Spirit begins revealing to us our new identity. The Holy Spirit begins revealing to us our new identity. Some of you are in this stage two, right? Uh, and, and, and Paul describes when he talks about the gospels, this is usually one of the first jobs that the Holy Spirit has in our life after like touchdown, right? Like after, after the Holy Spirit's entered into our life, often what Paul describes is the Holy Spirit starts telling you about your new identity. And perhaps it's quiet and subtle at first. It comes in those moments where we think to ourselves, man, I'm a failure. The Holy Spirit comes up, nudge, 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 poke, poke, poke. That's not who you are. Or we might think to ourselves, we think, oh man, I'm worth nothing. I'm worthless. The Holy Spirit comes up, nudge, nudge, poke, poke. That's not true either. And if we start listening in this stage, right, to that nudge, nudge, that poke, poke of the Holy Spirit, Paul says that the Spirit begins to testify with our spirit that we are actually children of God. That we have a new identity that is so intense and powerful and overwhelming that like we can boldly approach the creator of the universe and say, Abba, Dada, Father. This is the stage that Jesus describes when he has this meeting with Nicodemus in John chapter three as being born again, a new identity. And, and after we finally start listening to what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us about our new identity, well then the Holy Spirit does even more. Stage three. That's when we live that new identity by the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to live like children of God. 
like the Holy Spirit begins pruning and, and begins shaping our life. The Holy Spirit begins to convict us if something is inconsistent between how we live and this identity that we have. The Holy Spirit begins to start to warn us if, if there's something dangerous for our soul. The Holy Spirit begins to illuminate scripture and, and give us a deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, right? Like the, the Bible begins to make more and more sense. The Holy Spirit equips us be able to do crazy things we never thought possible. And as we walk with the Holy Spirit, that new identity that we never thought could be us becomes us. Our life begins to blossom. And then we bear fruit, right? Supernatural levels of love Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fireworks. Sometimes we can hardly even recognize ourselves in the mirror as we're in stage three, right? Because the Holy Spirit that at first told us that we are a child of God has been at work and has made it so. Experiencing God's promise being fulfilled in your life, like the Holy Spirit, is one of the most important things that could ever happen to you. It's so important that it's the core of the letter of Galatians. Even more than that, it's the key to understanding like the book of Galatians. Even more than that, it's like the grand theme and firework show at the end, right? This is like, it, it helps us even understand what's happening through the whole story arc of the Bible. Wherever you are at on that journey, go this week and start reading Galatians 3 and 4. Begin to sink your teeth in. It may be complicated, a complicated few chapters, but you have the key to understand it. Let's pray together. Now, Father, the book of Galatians, the letter of Galatians, um, man, there's so much in there that starts to make way more sense as we start to understand the Holy Spirit. Why it is that Paul's so upset with the Galatians as they're, as they're turning back and saying, man, you know what, I think it's a to-do list we need to do. I think we need, I think we need the laws, not the Holy Spirit. And they're trying to shove your presence back into the temple and like sew the curtain back together. Man, I know sometimes the, the presence, your very presence in our life is overpowering and overwhelming. So sometimes, like Tozer says, we, we put up the veil in our own hearts. It's safe, a safe distance. <laughs> we keep you at arm's length. We stay at stage one. Man, if we want to experience this, this promise, this key thing that Paul's talking about, I pray that this week ahead, that the gospel would start to take root. That, that we'd start listening to that voice that at first says, here's your new identity. And as we keep walking, makes it so. Makes it true of our life. It's not just words, it becomes the reality of our life. Would you start that process? Wherever we are at today, would you, would you help us to recognize the significance of what's been given to us? We've been given cosmic power and presence. Would you help us to draw our hearts near to you.
and for the Holy Spirit to be at work in our lives. Children of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.